Hello, and welcome to Banking Transform, the top podcast in retail banking. I'm your host, Jim Roos, founder and CEO of the Digital Banking Report and co-publisher of the financial brand. Banks are making significant investments in their data and analytics initiatives. Unfortunately, most organizations struggle moving from the data preparation and analytics phase to the last mile of data implementation and utilization where insights are translated into better process changes and better customer experiences. The last mile is where the focus moves from great reports to exceptional results. At this stage, the insights generated become part of improving the internal processes and personalization that helps decision-making and improves customer experiences. On the show today, we have Greg Spencer, Senior Sales Engineer at Segment an alchemy company. Greg shares how banks and credit unions must focus on finishing strong as they leverage insights for improved results. You know, for a marathon runner or a distant cyclist, the final mile is not only the most grueling part of the journey, but also the most rewarding. Without adequate planning and attention to details, it is tough to complete the journey. The same is true when you're using data and analytics to drive better processes and customer experiences. Banks and credit unions must prioritize the last mile of the data analytics journey and work backwards. You know, also organizations must finish the journey. This means that unless the processes are optimized and the customer experience is enhanced, the entire data and analytics journey is really for naught. So Greg, How often do you see organizations start strong with their data and analytics initiatives only to see the entire process break down during the final mile when the rewards of doing the hard work really pay off? Yeah, well, Jim, it's a great question. And, you know, in my experience in the industry, you know, this happens, you know, uh, more often than I think we'd like, you know, virtually, virtually everyone on their data analytics journey um, has the best of intentions, you know, starting with building a data warehouse, integrating multiple data sources, delivering reports and charts and visualizations in an automated fashion to business stakeholders. That's, that's very tangible. And that's a great start. But as you know, Jim, that's just really the first leg, Um, you know, turning that into actionable strategies and curated experiences, workflow improvement movements and so forth. That takes vision and strategy up front and having the correct tools and technology at the end and and truly being committed to becoming a data-driven organization culturally along the way. So, but the rewards absolutely pay off. You know, uh, our clients at Segment, you know, typically see an 18 to 20X ROI uh, in the first year of economic value for those that cross the finish line and use the data to activate relevant personalized campaigns and offers. It's worth the tough work. You know, your background is actually working at a credit union as a client, a segment. So it's very interesting because how, from your perspective, how hard was it to take the data and analytics and the vision and the insights that was provided by segment and actually apply them towards better workflows, maybe better engagement within the organization, and maybe better, even better marketing where you could actually show the customer you knew about them as opposed to simply making better reports. Yeah, I mean, it it was definitely a challenge, Um, you know, unwinding the way things have always been done, you know, breaking down those barriers is a big undertaking. It requires, you know, dedicated resources, both, you know, monetary and human capital uh, in order to make that happen. You know, data transformation is truly a cultural change. You know, it's done over time. It takes grit and determination, Um, you know, specific to marketing. You know, we see institutions that, you know, have typically uh, uh, approached the market with a with a campaign calendar approach. Uh, you know, with a high degree of product focus, you know, that's been successful, you know, over the last couple of decades to a certain degree, you know, they hit everyone with a seasonably appropriate offering, you know, or a new product that they developed uh, to compete in the current market. Uh, They blast it out across all channels for a few weeks and months and then shutter it down and then ramp up for the next campaign. But as technology and consumer behavior and preferences have evolved, you know, what we've learned is that the problem with that historical approach uh, is that if that is your exclusive or primary way in which you're marketing um, and, and and connecting with your account holders, they're going to see right through it now. You know, they're not, they're they're savvy enough to know you know what is firehose marketing marketing and you know what is what is you know no longer relevant to them. And if messages are not tailored you know to the right audience and available at the right times for them uh, in the scope of their life cycle or journey, they're statistically less effective. You know what what you've done, what you've accomplished, has just created noise to that consumer, and they're going to tune you out. 
Um, you know, beyond marketing, though, you know, I can say that you know, putting together an effective data strategy, uh, if you if you approach it the right way and you lay out your priorities and and, and your vision upfront and you align uh, the vision with the institution uh, from a from a business stakeholder standpoint, you can achieve fantastic success across all levels of the organization. Um, you know, it it can inform and open up efficiencies for virtually every line of business. You know, but to succeed in the beginning as well as in the end, it's really important that you. Uh, you select an excellent technology provider, you know, someone who is going to be a partner for you along the way, who's also going to be as impactful and efficient as possible, as quickly as possible without overburdening the rest of the organization. You know, so allowing a partner like Segment, you know, candidly to do uh, what they do best, you know, for us in my, in my previous role was uh, an incredibly um, uh, successful venture for us. You know, it gave us back valuable time and energy uh, that so that we could, we could focus what we needed to do uh, to, to continue to move the organization forward uh, across the entire organization. So, Greg, do you think institutions that are not using data for improved processes and for customer personalization are actually damaging their business as opposed to simply maybe working in the status quo positioning? It's a very real possibility. You know, it all comes down to relevancy. Um, and if you aren't relevant, you're either creating a bad experience with unintended consequences or it's a missed opportunity. You know, a great example of this would be, you know, you have an auto loan campaign and you have multiple people within that audience who are in different lifestyle stages or have uh, different socioeconomic situ situations. So in one instance, you may have an individual who is high net worth, uh, who enjoys the outdoors. What may be relevant or, or draw that person in may be an image or messaging around a luxury SUV. But if you put that same message in front of another candidate within the uh, within the same campaign who has student loan debt and recently started supplementing their income, you know, with a with a side hustle in the gig economy, that luxury SUV is probably not going to resonate. You know, what might be better for them could be something that's more economically focused or rate driven. So not leveraging the data that you have and not making the, the experience something that is relevant to the potential uh, uh, account holder or prospect or customer, you're shooting yourself in the foot. You know, it's interesting. This is um, in, in you working with Segment from, from a financial institution basis, but also now working for Segment. Do you find that organizations sometimes hesitate in implementing programs because they don't think their data is good enough when in effect, if I'm not mistaken, Segment can actually take what I call dirty data. I don't mean dirty as in bad data, but I mean in silos and not formatted correctly. And you can actually, as Segment, put this into a format that can bring good rewards, can't you? Absolutely. You know, what, what Segment does at a world-class level is cleaning, categorizing, and contextualizing all of that, those cryptic transaction strings in, conjun in conjunction with the rest of the core data to build these key lifestyle indicator data tags. Those data tags become super easy to understand. They're lightweight. They're literally, you know, binary tag values that indicate yes or no. And you can leverage that in, a, in, a, in our platform to be able to create those always on campaigns such that when people flow in and out who, who, who meet new criteria or fall out of existing criteria, they would only see messages that are relevant if they actually meet, meet that particular audience at that point in time. So you're able to leverage the automation along with this rich, cleansed, um, accurate and easy to understand um, uh, data elements that you, that can be brought forward to you know the, the 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 typical marketing business user without having to write complex queries across multiple data sets automatic nightly refreshes you know it's a, it's a great setup so how big was the credit union you worked at uh, just under two and a half billion okay so for all of our listeners that think geez I can't do what Greg's done or I can't implement a segment solution the reality is any organization of any size, the biggest and the smallest can implement this. And I will say just from my experience, your organization was punching above their weight from the standpoint of using data and analytics and driving better processes and better personalization in the marketplace. And these partnerships are key when we're talking about going forward, especially in an economy that right now is at best uncertain, where organizations really have to prioritize their investments to say, where can I get the biggest bang for my buck? How can I get the, the lowest hanging fruit and, and develop ideas going forward? But sometimes, Greg's financial institutions are looking for a, you know, can I get an ROI that's going to at least pay for the program itself? 
so I can get a deeper investment. So, you know, there are some organizations that are obviously reaching the finish line. Your credit union is one. What sort of ROI have the best organizations achieved in working with Segment? Yeah, so for, for 2021, our 160 plus clients on average uh, saw an ROI in the 18 to 20 X range. You know, few lower, but there were definitely some that were higher, like in the, in the 30 yeah. X range. And that's not based on on our our metrics. That's their that's the own in, the institution's own uh, metrics in terms of their their ROI uh, based on the products and acquisitions that they've been able to make leveraging our platform. And and what that does, you know, their experiences reinforce the reality uh, that leveraging highly informed, enriched, and personalized targeting surrounding the audience across multiple channels and mediums is an incredibly lucrative strategy, especially given the scale and efficiency it provides via the automation. So this was not just at your organization a like like to have or want to have. The reality was you were generating revenue from a marketing perspective. The marketing department was actually becoming a revenue center as opposed to a cost center because of this better targeting, this better implementation of data, correct? Correct. Doesn't even take into account the efficiencies, which of is the other not. side yeah, of the equation. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, when, when you look at it through the extension of uh, being able to turn data into you're, you're activating it, right? You're, you're actually deploying it in such a method that you're able to uh, uh, bring new business in um, in a direct fashion without having to make a significant investment on top of that. So AI modeling is obviously a major opportunity for fintech, for fintechs and and financial traditional financial institutions. It is also an area that we again talk a lot more than we actually do it. What are some ways that organizations should be considering putting emergent data emerging data technology into action? Yeah. So for for AI and machine learning in our space right now, you know the most practical applications are for product adoption across sell, um, attrition or customer churn, uh, and understanding financial wellness. There's more to come, and I'm excited about that. But right now, these are the audience models uh, that we, we're seeing uh, deployed more frequently, and ones that we're continuously enhancing ourselves. Um, and because Segment has done all of that difficult work in terms of the, the data cleansing, uh, contextualization, and creating that normalized and standardized uh, data set um, uh, off of all of that rich and valuable transaction data, we're able to deploy these models in a much faster uh, fashion for our clients. You mentioned transaction data, and, and you know, the, I've been in banking long enough to know that the one area is that we really lost as far as financial institutions was giving away a lot of the payments and POS system integrations that we used to have because that carried a lot of transaction data. But that's before we realized that transaction data would be able to be processed into better communication. So how important is transaction data and real-time engagement to the overall success of the personalization process? It's critical, you know, candidly, you know, ultimately the transactions that a customer is performing um, is giving the institution rich insights into their behaviors, lifestyles, and preferences. You know, it's a unique source of information that financial institutions have versus other industry verticals. And it's through that transaction data analysis that FIs have this, these incredible opportunities for creating those personalizations and, and being relevant um, in the lives of their, of, of their customers. You know, our solutions allow FIs to securely tap into, you know, audiences based on behavior going from one to many to one to few to one to one engagement and you know the those those real-time engagements are important you know said simply the value of most data points depreciates over time so the closer you can get to when it actually yeah. happens the more valuable it can become uh, for most of your organizations how often are they providing you data or is there a direct link for um for data that makes it so you can do the real-time communication so most of our institutions are uh, providing us data for our marketing automation solution uh, nightly. So uh, wow. the, the nightly process, you know, returns the, the data back with automated uh, conversions. But we do have uh, institutions who do it more frequently, you know, do intraday uh, connections. And our, our merchant payment cleansing uh, solution is real time in that we can we can return dirty strings via our API uh, in real time and deploy and allow the institution to deploy it in a number of fashions. Along those lines, you know, we are, um, you know, recently announced earlier this year, uh, we've we're going to be deploying a native application within the Snowflake environment, whereby um, uh, institutions can uh, cleanse transactions in, in real time in their environment without having it to leave as part of that native application. Wow, that's that's transformational. That's a, that's a big deal, especially for those organizations that are using real time transaction data. You know, we often talk 
when we're talking data and AI and analytics, a lot of the focus, and especially in our podcast, because we're talking to a lot of marketers, is around marketing applications. I think we both agree that financial institutions are also leaving a lot of money on the table when they don't incorporate the findings, the insights into the, the into their operational strategy and, and fine tuning what happens below the glass as opposed to simply above the glass. What are some strategies that you can share on how the data and insights that segment can provide really helps things beyond marketing? Sure. So I'd start with recommending using the data to better understand uh, consumer channel and product usage uh, behaviors and preferences. You know, for those of us who have been in the financial services space for a long time, we've all been guilty of this at some point. Um, in terms of baking certain assumptions in um, about the use or lack thereof of our products, services, and channels, we sometimes have the tendency to look at those metrics and their performance in a vacuum without taking a step back and looking at the broader picture and potentially patterns that are being presented to us. So along those lines, one of the first areas from a from a from a tactical standpoint that I'd look at is looking at the interchange side of the house and looking for recurring or subscription payments that are happening on, on non-debit uh, or point of sale rails and look to convert them um, into a, a revenue opportunity for you going forward. You know, similarly, I'd look to uncover uh, small business opportunities where you've got consumers who are making um, uh, small business or business type transactions in their retail accounts, potentially even paying a small business loan um, and, and look to see whether or not there's an opportunity to bring them over onto, the, onto your business platform. I'd go a step further too and say, I would take and use segments cleansed and enriched and highly contextualized data tags as an enhancement to existing uh, product and customer channel portfolio reporting and analytics from a competitive and SWOT type analysis. So as an example, you know, in, in, the, in the typical, you know, community financial uh, market, you know, there's a there's always been a high interest in looking at, you know, average number of products per or services per household or per customer. What I would do is I would look to add uh, the data that segment is providing back uh, and look at it of uh, through the lens of what's the average number of uh, competitive products that the that the customer is using uh, within those product and channel and average customer type of reports look like. Um, and because the question behind the question here becomes, why are they doing this? What is it about the, your products and your delivery that can be improved to get in front of this? You know, the short put here obviously is marketing to them from a win back standpoint, but operationally speaking, you know, it can give you greater insight into both weaknesses and opportunities within your four walls. You know, it's interesting. I, we were talking to somebody on a podcast earlier this year that said that they looked at they looked at analytics to determine where did funds flow go after the government gave some some uh, you know some help in the with the checks that came to the households during the during COVID, and they found that even though we all got really excited about the amount of deposits that were made, a lot of a lot of a lot of transfers were made to companies like Robinhood and SoFi and other players in the marketplace, as you just mentioned. You know how important is it to look at funds flow? as well, more than just transaction, but flow of funds in and out of an organization, again, to know, you know, who, who's eating my lunch? Yeah, it's it's very important, right? Because you're not just concerned about the the big players, the, the, the known entities that are out there. It's also about the, the challengers and the disruptors and those that are coming into market that are growing share away from you. So that's where you can you can start to leverage the data beyond just from a marketing standpoint and look at it more through the, the analytic lens to start to look at, you know, which areas or which competitors within certain categories are growing faster than we are, or we're seeing, you know, a, a further, uh, a, you know, degradation or outflow of funds, you know, from a disintermediation standpoint to these other channels, what do we need to do to start to position ourselves differently? You know, it's interesting. As good of a service that you provide and all the answers you provide, and you've mentioned 200 and some clients and all the winning strategies you come to the marketplace with and can share with other clients, the challenge sometimes is the best you can bring to an organization really depends on how the organization actually accepts it or what kind of roadblocks they may put in the way for you actually implementing what you want to implement. Now, you've been on both sides of the desk now, and you, and you understand probably more about, oh, geez, we were like that, or, oh, geez, thank goodness we didn't have that roadblock. But what do you see with your clients where you say, geez, if they didn't put this 
addendum to it. If they didn't say, oh, geez, we'd like to do what you said exactly, but we have some back office things we want to hold on to. What are some of the things you've seen that really make it so they don't get the best of what segment can provide? Yeah, I think, you know, there there are always going to be challenges, you know, within specific organizations and how they're structured and their culture and their previous technology investments. I think that, you know, in addition to trying to overcome and 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 explain to them the art of the possible and what is available once you have this data and get them going, you know, you still need to understand that there are there are places and 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 investments that they've made that are going to look competitive to them and there's a, always going to be that 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 struggle of as i think i mentioned you know the the previous ways of doing things change yeah. is hard yeah. right oh, so gosh, you yeah. know yeah. It, it is it is it is one of the biggest things so i think being able to talk about you know the the true impact and the ROI from our clients is probably one of the uh, uh, the best use cases, so to speak. You know that we can we can talk to uh, you know potential prospects or others who are looking at the space because once you once you take that step, once you take that leap, the rewards are going to be there for you. I mean that we've we've seen it. You know it's been repeated. You know by our cu customer base year over year, our renewals are fantastic. You know so I think. You know, there, there's no there's no silver bullet answer to your question, Jim. I think it's part of it's part of maintaining that ongoing dialogue and figuring out, you know, within their within their four walls, what makes sense for them. You know, typically uh, the segment solution we don't like to call it as something that's a rip and replace because there are there right. are different stopping points along the way that you can you can use to and you can you can kind of baby step, so to speak, in terms of do you just want the cleanse transactions or do you want the key lifestyle indicators? Do you want the models or do you want the full marketing automation suite? There's there's no one size fits all that needs to be you know thrust onto an institution. It really is about making sure that they're they're getting the value that they need um, you know at that time and that we're we're accurately presenting you know the, just how valuable the data actually is once we provide it back to them. You know, you just brought up a really good aspect of what I see happening in the marketplace in that you know let's say even a year and a half ago, a year ago, certainly before the economy is starting to turn south organization we're selling here's our total package we'd like you to take it all and you just reference the fact that a customer can come in and say i want this component or this component or this component as opposed to the whole thing a lot of this gets down to the importance of speed and scale compared to when you were at the credit union and even what's happened in the last year how important is speed and scale to the implementation and the actually implementation and diversification of the products come into the marketplace? How important has that become? It's become very important, especially when you're talking about, you know, a large uh, uh, financial purchase or technology decision for an institution, you know, getting those quick wins and not overburdening the institution from a from an onboarding perspective is super critical. And you know, candidly, you know, with with the relationships and the uh, and the partners that Segment has, you know, out in the market, they do it very very well um, in terms of being able to stand up an institution, you know, with the full insights and the platform, you know, in less than two months. And that is that is you know fully wow. ingesting you know uh, yeah. a year's worth of transaction insights. <laughs> to build some of those trends and behaviors and to have channels integrated for the institution without having to add to staff, um, it's pretty significant. You know, you bring up an interesting point and I won't bear on it too heavily here, but I was recently at an event with a bunch of financial institutions and you're talking about being able to implement in a couple months. We had major financial institutions at this event that said just the review of solution providers takes five or six months. And I said, we all have to think completely differently than we've ever done before because yeah. by the time you make that decision, the decision may not be good anymore. And I, I use the, the uh, and actually it's an example that I lived with during people trying to determine what digital banking platform they'd use. And I realized that organizations were taking 18 months to determine who to use when if they had made the decision on the day the decision making started, they would have made more money, made a bigger impact in the industry and in their marketplace if they had made the decision faster. So yeah. I think, you know, if people are listening, again, I'm going to keep on saying it probably every podcast, the important speed and scalability is of utmost importance. So a little bit of a pivot here, Greg, you know, Segment was recently acquired by Alchemy earlier this year. What enhancements did this bring to the table, especially when it comes to helping organizations conquer that final mile of data utilization. 
Sure. So to, so to say that the segment and Alchemy teams uh, are excited about the companies coming together uh, is an understatement. You know, the, the power and flexibility that this union is going to provide the mutual clients um, is going to be significant. You know, uh, providing the ability to serve and deliver, you know, those highly relevant personalized offers and experiences based on their uh, uh, behaviors and, and transactions throughout the digital banking platform experience is something that we're all looking forward to. Um, and, you know, candidly, that, that supports Alchemy's recent national study that was done in partnership uh, with the Center for Generational Kinetics that, you know, among the, the many key findings was that uh, respondents said the number one requirement for choosing a financial institution was a good website and banking app. So combined with the continuously growing expectation of that uh, uh, personalized experience, we believe that the combined power of Segment and Alchemy, you know, meets these needs head on for financial institutions. Uh, the ability to serve uh, those relevant and timely uh, content and messages and offers offers within the be best digital banking experience the, uh, the market has. Um, ultimately, though, you know, the, the Alchemy acquisition of Segment uh, benefits financial institutions well beyond um, uh, the integrations. Uh, the combined data sets between the two companies will provide users a much more complete view of their account holders while both training segments current data models for greater precision and expanding them to additional use cases. And FIs will then be able to uh, leverage this data uh, throughout the rest of their digital properties with relevant content. You know, it's also interesting as I'm familiar with Alchemy and, and your, your customer base, your financial institution customer bases are very aligned from a size perspective, from a focus perspective, what you're trying to achieve. And that, that always helps in a merger of, of companies that have aligned strategies, but, but d deal in different parts of the business. So that's going to be exciting to see what happens. You know, Greg, you know, it's interesting because you have, again, the perspective of both the financial institution and of the solution provider now. What industry breaking trends do you see happening in the next one to two years that are going to really change the dynamics of how you can provide solutions in the marketplace? And just as importantly, if an organization was going to start today, where should they start? Sure. So I think first, uh, you know, from, from my seat, I think the pace of continuous disruption is going to remain high. Um, you know, it wasn't very long ago that we were all focused on, you know, the non-traditional competitors and tech stalwarts like Apple and Amazon and Google and, and Walmart becoming banks. And, and that's and that's still true. That's still a threat. Uh, but I think the 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 tenor of the dialogue now has changed and has shifted to being less about like uh, who the competitor is and more about do we truly understand what competition is? You know, what is it that we're competing for? And regardless of whether or not you look at that dilemma through the lens of low cost deposits or payments or money movement or lending, the reality is, is that it's going to come down to consumer behaviors and preferences and making sure that you're there for in the, in, in the consideration set when their decisions are being made. So uh, regardless of, of which side of the fence you sit on as it relates to the future of you know banking as a service or embedded finance or decentralized finance, I think that as lessons are learned from some of these early market entries, you know, some of the fault starts that have been out there, I think that the new entries will be will, the, the revised providers in the space are going to have uh, uh, are going to do much better. And I think that financial institutions are going to be affected in more, way, more ways than one. Um, you know, last but not least, you know, I'd say that the, the rapid acceleration of not just data, but back end technology infrastructure to the cloud is not likely to slow down. Um, in the near term. The ability to connect multiple technologies to the same data pool um, and run multiple applications and systems on top of it without degrading performance is an emerging competitive edge. You know, it's one of the reasons why Segment, you know, has partnered with Snowflake, you know, with our merchant payment cleansing solution uh, in the native app, because we believe that there's much more to come in this space. So I think if I were to, to boil it down to what should an institution be doing today, um, I take a temperature internally to figure out, you know, where where does the institution currently see uh, 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 banking as a service, embedded finance, um, and and be prepared as this shift continues to move towards, you know, the whole open banking environment. Where and how do you want to prioritize your resources to protecting your base? Boy, Greg, you said a lot in that one one segment, and, and it's so important because I think you know we both know that embedded finance, banking and service, and all that is is number one. It's going to be part of every one of our organizations. Number two, you can't do any of that without using data analytics to streamline your back office first and also make better customer experiences because you'll have nothing to compete against if you, or compete for. You won't have that differentiation that you need. And most importantly, I think your key message there was you got to do it now. 
you can't keep on waiting for the next train because the trains left the station already. We're all playing catch up. Yeah. And it's the, important in knowing that if you can find the right data analytics and implementation partner, you're going to be able to reach that final mile at full speed and actually go, as I say many times, go beyond great reports to fantastic experiences. And that's a revenue game. That's not a cost cutting game. That's not a nice to know type scenario. It's really a differentiator that's going to make a difference in the marketplace going forward. Greg, thanks for being on the show today. You've been a great guest and, and really provide insights. It's always good to have somebody that's jump sides of the desk. I, I did that. In fact, very similar to you, I went from the banking world to the direct marketing world. So in an old school way, I, I kind of did the same thing. <laughs> but I'm, I, you know, as, as you're finding out, it's, it's kind of a big play box to play around now. It's kind of nice. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jim, for the time and opportunity. It was a pleasure meeting with you. Thanks for listening to Banking Transform, the winner of three international awards for podcast excellence. If you enjoyed today's interview, please give our show a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform. Also, be sure to catch my recent articles on the financial brand and the research we're doing for the Digital Bank Report. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to our producer, Leah Haslidge, audio engineer, Sean Roe Hoffman, and video producer, Will Pritz. I'm your host, Jim Roos. Until next time, remember, it's not about how much you know about your customers. It's about how much your customers know you know them. <laughs>